Good afternoon and welcome to Where Do We Go From Here? The final panel as part of today's symposium on the press, the presidency and trust sponsored by the Institute of Politics and Public Service, AKA GU Politics and the White House Correspondents Association. My name is Stacey Hartman and I'm a graduating senior in the School of Foreign Service studying international politics and economics. I'm currently serving as the co-chair of the Student Leadership Council here at GU Politics and I've been heavily involved with the Institute during my four years at Georgetown. It is my honor to introduce today's panel. Zeke Miller is the president of the White House Correspondents Association. He is a White House reporter for the Associated Press, having previously been a White House correspondent for Time and Buzz BuzzFeed's first ever White House correspondent. Geopolitics is grateful for our partnership with the White House Correspondents Association in making today's symposium possible. Our second guest, Jen Psaki, currently serves as the White House Press Secretary for the Biden-Harris administration. She previously served in the Obama administration as the White House Communications Director, spokesperson at the Department of State, and in a variety of other capacities. Arguably, her most important former role is that of a geopolitics fellow in our spring 2017 class. We're delighted to have Ms. Psaki back at geopolitics. This conversation will be moderated by our Executive Director of Geopolitics, Mo Alifi. You can stay engaged with this discussion on social media by tagging at geopolitics and hashtag geopolitics forum. For those that are in the Zoom room today, you can submit questions using our Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please be sure to include your name and your affiliation. Mo, over to you. Stacey, thanks so much for the, for the great introduction. Uh, and thank you so much for all of your student leadership throughout your time at Georgetown here at GU Politics. We are certainly gonna miss you after you graduate but are excited to see what you do next. Uh, and I wouldn't be sur surprised if, uh, if we don't have you back as a guest on one of these uh, panels in the not too distant future. So thank you. Uh, and thank everyone for joining us today in the third and final panel of our symposium uh, co-hosted by the White House Correspondents Association. I wanna give a special welcome to the 2021 White House Correspondents Association scholarship winners, uh, many of whom are with us today. They were announced last week and joining us uh, from across the country. Since the association started helping journalism students in 1991, it's awarded more than one and a half million dollars in scholarships, which is pretty tremendous. You can find more information about the scholarship and this year's recipients online at whca.press. We've had a day full of interesting conversations. The first one talking about sort of where we are, how we got to the point we're at when it comes to the press and the White House and trust. Uh, featuring former White House press secretaries and correspondents. We had a fascinating conversation midday about the importance of who the storytellers are and the importance of diversity in the briefing room. And now we've got this fascinating conversation between uh, the White House press secretary and the head of the White House Correspondents Association. Uh, and uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to hearing what they both have to say. Um, I want to start, we're going to kind of think about today's discussion in three categories. First, what are their roles? What's the role of the Correspondent Association? What's the role of the press secretary? The role of the press in, in the democratic uh, system? Second major bucket is, since we're focusing on trust, trust in the institutions of government and the press. And then finally, looking at trust between those institutions, between the press and government. And so I want to start with Zeke um, and ask you, you're as president of the White House Correspondents Association. Most people know it because of the dinner that uh, it held pre-pandemic every year, um, which sometimes was a newsworthy event in and of itself. But the association does much more than put on a dinner. Tell us a little bit about the role of the association. Well, well first, Mo, thank you uh, for your partnership in this event. Uh, this has been a fantastic day. And uh, thank you, Stacey, for that introduction as well. Um, you know, you know we're, we're probably best known for the dinner, but it, it makes up 5% of what we do uh, as an association. The rest of it is working on you know, mentoring the next generation of journalists. So welcome to all of our WHC scholars here uh, right now. That's, that's, that's another facet of what we do. But you know, the, the primary day in and day out uh, role of the w WHCA, of the Correspondent Association, of myself as president, is sort of facilitating the public's access to the president and the presidency um, through working journalists who are at the White House day in and day out. That's logistics, 
it's, you know, it's the stuff that you don't see on television. It's, you know, it's, um, you know, what time, you know, uh, you know how, how, how are journalists going to get from site A to site B uh, to cover a foreign trip, something overseas. Um, and then, you know, over the last year, a lot of it has been, uh, been, been COVID restrictions, you know, becoming amateur contact tracers ourselves. How do we keep our workforce safe, our, our colleagues safe, while also ensuring that the critical work of, of covering the presidency at, a, at really a, one of the most important times to keep, uh, to keep the public informed can continue uninterrupted. Uh, that's been you know, really you know, my primary uh, mission uh, since I took over this job in July. Jen, I wanna ask you a similar question. Um, people see the White House press secretary at the podium, uh, but the job is bigger than that. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just take a couple moments and tell us what is the job of a White House press secretary? Uh, well, Mo, thank you again. It's great to be back with the geopolitics family, um, which I and I love my fellowship and great to be here with all of you today. Um, I will say, you know, you touched on the fact that the briefing is how people see the White House press secretary um, historically and day in and day out. Uh, that's just a sliver of what the job is. Uh, and what the job is really focused on is communicating the policies and also the viewpoints uh, of the administration, but also of the president of the United States. And that takes many forms. The briefing is one of them. Um, it's quite efficient. Um, and also it's an important message of transparency to the public. That's why we return to doing it five days a week and uh, are consistent about that in this administration. But also the job of the press secretary is to do things like sit in policy meetings, give feedback, um, you know, obviously prep the president of the United States for interviews, for press conferences, for some meetings and engage in that. And also to do things that uh, like that Zeke referenced, you know, we're in a moment where we are, we are engaging in a very different way with the public because there are limited numbers of people who can come into the White House. So it's working in partnership with the White House Correspondents Association to figure out, okay, if we don't have a full briefing room, how do we um, figure out how to get more people in? And how do we figure out how to get um, more, how to get our information out to the public? I mean, that's on us, but we work in partnership to also uh, deal with different challenging uh, circumstances like COVID is for us with the Correspondents Association and the media as well. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the audience knows that in my previous life, I worked in political communications, never at the White House, but I was, you know, a spokesman for a national party. I was a spokesman for presidential candidates. And one of the things that I, I often found I had to, a needle I had to thread was how, you know, when was I being an advocate for my boss? When was I being an advocate for the press? What happens when those two things come into conflict? Jen, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, I will say first that, um, you know, your primary job as the White House press secretary is to uh, work on behalf of the president and the administration to provide information to the American public. And uh, that means working in a transparent and a, a way with the, with the press, because that's also the goal of the press corps, right, is to provide accurate, up-to-date information to the American public. But there is a push and pull, which you referenced, Mo, and I think any of us, you, myself, others who've worked in national politics and worked for um, campaigns and for the National Party recognize, uh, is that it's the job of the press, which Z can speak to, of course, better than I can, to push, right? To get access to the president every day, to ask questions every single day. Um, it is my job or the job of the White House and the press secretary to decide when that is in in uh, the president's interests and when and sometimes it's in the national interests, right? Because we should put the president out because it's time for him to uh, talk about an issue because it's time for him to present uh, what our positions are on a particular issue. But there's a push and pull, right? Because you, well, well there are, there's an alignment about objectives and in, in way, more ways than I think people recognize, right? There also are going to be disagreements because by necessity, the press wants to have access as much as they can, as frequently as they can. And for from my vantage point or for the government, that's not always in our interest because there isn't more to say. There's not more information to provide from the president of the United States. So there's a bit of a push and pull, I would say, and kind of a constant evaluation about how to kind of meet that bar. The other thing I will say that is, is more about the moment we live in is that, you know, I remember when I started in the Obama administration, there was this expectation that we were going to do a rotation of the networks for interviews, right? And that they deserved an interview, 
right? Uh, no, people deserve accurate information. They deserve responsiveness. They deserve um, honesty. But you know, our job is to get information out to the public. The media is a means of doing that. Uh, it's not the only means of doing that. And I think that has been more of a battle over the last 10 years or so. That actually is a great springboard to a number of questions that I had for, for each of you. Um, so I'm going to try to build on it a bit. Um, you both st uh, first started working in the White House during the Obama era, right? Zeke covering the Obama administration, Jen working in the Obama administration. I mean, look, when I first started working in politics, I, I, I didn't have gray hair. Um, and the changes that we have seen during that period of time in the media ecosystem, in the media landscape, and the way people communicate is remarkable. But I'm curious, and Zeke, I'll start with you, just since the Obama administration, right, just in a few short years, what changes have you seen in the media landscape that have made your current job easier? And which ones have made your current job more challenging or just different? Let's start with Zeke and then go to Jen. I think, you know, the biggest thing has been sort of the embrace by everyone in Washington, everybody in, in politics and everyone around the world, really, of, of social media as a primary means of disseminating information. It just means that I think we heard in one of the earlier panels, it's no such thing as the as the, the, I think it was Robert Gibbs saying, uh, there was no, there's no such thing as a news cycle anymore that's outdated. There's sort of the news of the moment, and then there's the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. Uh, you know, that, that's that that is absolutely true. We've seen this acceleration uh, of, of of story of storylines of the, of the way information is shared. Uh, as a journalist, that's that is both great because there's always something new to write. We're always looking to find a, a new way to put a, a new top on a story, make it seem fresh for readers. Our, our goal at the end of the day is to keep people informed, keep them engaged with stories. And sometimes that means, you know, a story today needs to look a little bit different than it does than it did yesterday, even if there's not really necessarily a, a huge leap forward. But, you know, we want the, the, the American public or people around the world to, to know what's going on. We need to keep them engaged. So the newness that that feed is, is you know that, uh, that steady stream of, of of stuff that is new is, is good for news at the same time you know it's not, not necessarily great for our quality of life you know whether it be 2 a.m tweets or uh you know just you know you know a, a day packed full of briefings that you don't have time to run out for lunch um you know that it's you know we're not asking for sympathy here but uh that, that is certainly the, 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 the biggest challenge and sort of you know it also does make it at times i think we heard one of the other panels as well you know it's, it's a little bit harder to step back and, and think thoughtfully and critically about what you're what you're going to write and how to frame it the best way and you know what is the most important thing that people need to know right now uh but i think that's you know something we struggle with but i think at the end of the day by and large we we, we do ultimately get it right even you know i think it, it's also just re important to remember there you know remember it, it, part of all this when we talk about the press briefing and white house journalism in general you know the briefing is just one part of, of, of white house journals stay if you know 45 minutes, an hour, an hour, 15 tops, really, uh, you know, of a, of a 10, 12 hour day, you know, that's not the final work product. We've got a lot of time after that to, you know, frame stories and, and, and write them and package them up in a way for audiences, you know, in the U S and around the world that makes them relevant to them. And so I think, you know, there is a bit of time there, but certainly the, the change in media landscape is, is something you certainly can't ignore. Yeah. There's also what people don't see is a lot of the communication that happens between reporters and the White House staff is not in the briefing, right? It is, sometimes you're explaining the context of a decision or the thinking behind something or providing more information that just wouldn't, the briefing room is not necessarily the format for, right? Because it requires nuance, it requires more time, it requires um, just like a different uh, means of talking about an issue that the briefing room isn't always the format for. So that's, uh, that's just another thing people don't see. Although I will say, um, you know, I think the briefing, what people don't see about the briefing from my vantage point is that it does a couple of things. One, you get an influx of a lot of the same questions, not all the same, but about the news of the day. It's quite efficient in that way because you can address a lot of the news of the day questions. It also is a forecasting mechanism in the building for making decisions. We have to say something about X. AP is going to ask about Y, um, and that sometimes that's a good for the muscle of a White House too. You know, Jen, I think there's a uh, sort of observers of politics oftentimes like to compare, right? Compare previous, you know, 
the sitting White House press secretary to their predecessors or how the current administration uh, approaches it compared to the previous administration. And I would just assume that there's a lot of factors that go into that, right? The strengths and, and, and weaknesses of your particular boss, right? What are they good at? What do they enjoy doing? What, you know, what are they comfortable with? The times that you're living in. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a lot of different factors. And so I'm wondering, you were there when you turned off, when, when they turned off the lights in the Obama administration, but then you were there to turn on the lights in the Biden administration. You're coming in with a whole new boss. Yeah. How, do, how did you sort of take all of that, synthesize all of those data points to come up with how you were going to approach your job? First, I talked to a lot of my predecessors. I mean, I talked to um, all, I would say, almost all of the Clinton press secretaries, the Obama ones, um, Dana Perino. Uh, you know, I talked to a lot of my predecessors and just asked them, you know, what, they're, what, they did, what they didn't know they wish they knew, right? And looking back, what are some of the things they would have done differently? A lot of them had similar advice. It wasn't like a group chat. So I had in one-on-one conversation right. that, you know, it's a reminder, although that would be fun. Maybe we'll do that post COVID, but um, is that um, you're talking to the American people. You're not, you're not, sometimes it feels good to win an argument in the room, but that's not always attractive on television or how it plays out when people are reading that exchange, right? It's not always in the interest, I should say, of the administration that you have to remember who you're talking to. It sounds like pretty obvious advice, but a lot of people said that to me because look, you're tired. Sometimes you get a little heated and um, you kind of have to remember who you're talking to. Um, And then the other thing, which is, again, seems obvious, but I thought it was really good advice that stuck to me is the best days are the days where you have something to say, right? I mean, you know, there are days where you don't go out there with a lot of new information just because you're doing it every day. And sometimes there's not massive, massive development from one day to the next, but the best days are when you go out there and you have something to add, something new to add to the story, something, a new detail, new specifics. That's also to the advantage of the press corps, right? So that there's some takeaway, something they're getting from the briefing. And it's not just a back and forth about whether we're bipartisan or not, you know? Um, So that's the other, I mean, I, I talked to a lot of my predecessors, but I will say, you know, a conversation I had with then the president-elect also really stuck with me most centrally, which was just about this moment of time where we were living in or we were coming into. Because, you know, following the Trump administration and just what the briefing was in that period of time um, and just a lot of people's nerve endings were pretty afraid. I mean, I'm a Democrat, right? But I'm just being, you know, um, a little diplomatic about it. Um The president's take was, we got to be really focused on the tone, right? The tone which we're speaking from that briefing room from, right? Uh, You can have disagreements. He has moments where he disagrees with the line of questioning or frame of questioning, of course, but the tone is a part of what we're, the message we're sending to, to the country, to the world. We value the press. We value the role of the press. We value the importance of sharing information. doesn't mean every day you meet that bar, but you know the tone was a big part of what we talked about and like how, what role that could play in, in trying to rebuild trust. Another element of sort of the times we're in, right? I mean, look, Zeke, I, I've always thought that one of the main roles of the press is to help connect us, right? Connect us to, to what's happening in Washington, connecting us to stories around the country. And never has that been more important than the past year plus, right? When we all feel so isolated and disconnected. But your access as a reporter had to radically change, right? Across two administrations because of public health measures and protocols. How did, yeah, talk a little bit about how you and your colleagues in the White House uh, press corps tried to cover government's response to this pandemic when you had limited access to people at least in a traditional way. Sure. I mean, I go back to there was this one press briefing that uh, that President Trump did with a bunch of the health experts, Dr. Fauci and some others in, in the in the Brady press room, which has, you know, uh, 49 seats plus, you know, untold number of people standing in the aisles. And it's this room of it got to be north of 100 people at the very beginning of the pandemic. And looking back on that photo right now, I think like, we were, we were nuts to not to see what, 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 you know, just what a couple of weeks later, what we would have recognized was, was behavior that was, you know, really, really risky. Um, and, you know, that's hopefully what we'll get back to, but, you know, sort of in, in, in where we are right now, I mean, 
you know, we are down to uh, 14 people seated in the, in the briefing room uh, on, on any given day. It's our hope to get back that up to about, you know, 50% or so sometime in the next few weeks now that more, you know, so many of our press corps are getting vaccinated. But, uh, you know, you know, it's harder and harder to do, to do the job when you're not there. You know, it was in, in a way a, a little bit, you know, easier in the sense that a lot of other people we were talking to at the White House, this White House, the previous White House, were also not physically in the building at times. Uh, they, they were working from home. But, you know, there, there's, you know, not being able to walk up to uh, the press office, you know, knock on the press secretary's door, whoever that press secretary is, and say, what, what are you thinking? What's going on today? What, what, what do you, what's going on tomorrow? How should we think about this story? I'm working on this story, and, you know, or, or, that, or this other thing. And, uh, you know, what's your take on this or what's your response? Um, that's, you know, that, that, you know, that, that, uh, that's a value loss for, for, for journalists and for the public at, at large. I mean, you know, that said, you know, we rely on what's the White House pool, which is this institution, sort of a representative cross section of, of all the different media formats uh, that's there day in and day out. It includes, you know, a foreign uh, reporter uh, from, the, from the foreign press uh, it, it, uh, at, at the White House, recognizing this is a global pandemic. Um, to sort of try to get at that cross section uh, of sort of the global press population as well, um, and so you know we're able to share information that way. Uh, but it's a challenge. It's it's something we've been struggling with for a year. At, at the end of the day, we have to keep people safe. And you know the worst thing for us would have been a you know a, a per, a, you know having you know dozens and dozens of journalists in the White House on a given day. One person got sick, forcing you know half of the Washington press corps to have to quarantine. And then nobody would be there to cover the president of the United States. That was an unacceptable solution to us. You know, the, 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 particularly given these times, you know, when, when people were isolated, they needed to get accurate, uh, timely information uh, about what their government was doing on their behalf, what they needed to know, how to keep themselves safe, how to keep their families safe. Um, and then also press there to sort of, you know, hold the administration's feet to the fire or, or you know, uh, you know, you know, engage, you know, test out their, their theories and, and ask questions, you know, uh, about policies and policy decisions on their behalf. So they knew what to do. And so we had to balance, you know, how to keep people safe and how to keep that work, uh, uh, going. And it's been, a, it's been a struggle, but I think we've been able to do it about as well as we possibly could have over the last you know, 15, 16 months. Um, I want to try to get to a bunch more topics, uh, but also want to turn to students relatively soon. So uh, let me move on to a couple of the big trust questions that I have for you. And Zeke, I'm going to stay with you for a little bit um, because the press, right, um, has, like almost every other major institution in the United States, is facing a trust deficit. Ari Fleischer talked about that a bit in this morning's panel about how the majority of the country does not trust mass media and that it's very polarized in many ways that a vast majority uh overwhelming majority of democrats trust the press but independents do not republicans certainly do not and that when you ask the question does the represent does, does the press understand people like me only one segment of the population says yes and that's college educated democrats so my question for you is you know why why do you think the press faces this trust deficit? And um, what lessons coming off of the last few years, when it, I think, really came to a head, um, do you think about uh, in, in trying to turn that corner? I, I think you know, there are a multitude of reasons why. Uh, you know, it, some of it is, is our own, some of it is politics. I, mean, I think it's one of those instances where a lot of ways you know, the press, um, you know, is downstream of the political discourse of, of the media industrial revolution we're, we're living through right now and, and some of those changes. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's reflective of the, of this new reality that, uh, which we're in, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, I personally, you know, give a lot of thought to and care a lot about because, you know, you know, I have, the, I, I work for the, the Associated Press. We heard from Julie Paisel earlier too, my, my boss, uh, full disclosure, uh, but, you know, we write for everyone. Uh, and, and, you know, I want to make sure that my copy, my stories, you know, are accessible to anyone on the ideological spectrum or whatever, you know, spectrum you want to use that it is, you know, it's factual, but it, there are no sort of barriers for entry. Uh, and, and that's uh, that, that, and I think more, and, and that's a, a challenge at times when, you know, there are people who uh, broadly may, may not accept don't want to necessarily accept certain facts for, for various, you know, for various reasons. And, and that, and that's fine. That is their right. But that is a discussion that I think, you know, 
takes it at maybe more broadly out of the media, the press, quote unquote. It's not our issue necessarily to fix alone. It is one that we as a society have to deal with. How do we you know, get back to a, sh- a shared sense, a set, set of common facts um, a, and a shared set of common discourse? We can all have a conversation. We can. There are people who may disagree and have, uh, and have ideological disagreements without being disagreeable. It, it may seem quaint and is quaint to a certain extent, but you know, I think that's the goal. You know, there are no, if there were easy answers to any of these questions, you know, we would have solved them by now. Uh, but you know, I think it's one that you know, I think just being mindful of the problem. And you know, recognizing the burden that we had to sort of m- maybe earn the trust of the of the people reading our stories and, and viewing our stories, um, and sort of keeping that that sort of front of mind every time we're writing, every time we're, uh, we're, we're, we're you know we're we're, we're reporting. Uh, well, you know, it won't solve the problem overnight, you know, but maybe it'll make it just a little bit better. And over time, that can have a real effect. Jen, that briefing room is very diverse, and that's good in many many ways. But I think it's also and the the media ecosystem itself is so fragmented now, right? And and you know, got long gone are the days where there were three big networks, and that's and the AP, and that's who you had to communicate to, and then the debate started there, right? Like, it is a very polarized press ecosystem now. How do you navigate that in trying to communicate to the American people? Uh, first, you're absolutely right. And what is hard, I think, for people to disseminate when they're at home is it's not like the members of the press corps have labels on them, right? Or that that would even mean anything to the public necessarily, right? Um, but, um, you know, because we have a smaller group of people in the briefing room, which, to, which to, truthfully is hard for us too, right? We'd love to have a much bigger group and have people flowing in and out of the building and we really want to get to that point. But it means that kind of every day in the briefing, there's one or two questions that are often good and interesting, but feel, but sometimes, not every day, they're from a particular point of view, right? Um, either it's from a particular advocacy type of point of view. Um, you know, there's one person who comes, every time this person comes, I know he's going to ask me a question related to abortion. Is that because it's an issue in the news that day? No. It's because that's the issue he's always going to ask about because of his outlet. You know that. What's confusing about that, I think, as consumers is like, why is this question being asked today? But it's not just about the media. I would think it's all I think it's also about social media and how things are disseminated. Right. Because what happens is um, a question is asked and then it becomes either you're rooting for the administration or you're rooting against the administration, right? And the same comment and the same exchange is frayed in whatever direction or political sway you may have. That is a big difference, right? From 10 years ago, 12 years ago, from how information used to flow um, and it's a challenge. What we've made a decision to do is that, um, you know, we're going to treat everybody in the briefing room and members of the media on our best days. Doesn't mean you don't have exchanges. That's part of the back and forth. That's democracy working. Um, We're going to take their questions and we're going to provide information and we're going to have a back and forth as warranted. Right. Um, And that having a war or a battle with a media organization is not in our interests. It's not in the interest of the American public. And frankly, it distracts from what we're trying to communicate about. That's a decision we've made. It doesn't mean everybody agrees with that. Uh, As you know, Mo, I mean, there are people in the Democratic Party who think we should be much harder on Fox or the Fox correspondents or what have you. Um, That's just not the president's approach. So therefore, it's not my approach. Um, And it's just the country needs something different from that in this moment in time, I think, is our evaluation. I was going to get to social media a little bit later, but since you just brought it up, I mean, social media and technology have also changed, not just how we consume and process information as voters, but how you communicate as well. I mean, yeah. you know, President, uh, the Obama administration was really the first Twitter presidency. I remember Robert Gibbs announcing the, the daily schedule via Twitter um, yeah. and thinking, whoa, this is so wild. Um, and then, of course, you know, your predecessor, the, the Trump administration sort of took Twitter. It was like Twitter on steroids, right? With, with how they used it. But it's, a, it's allowed a White House to go around the press at times to, to communicate more directly. Technology has allowed White Houses to communicate more directly. To your point earlier, that the media is, is a 
is a tool to communicate. You now have a bigger toolbox. Um, and so I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, your thoughts on the role of technology and, and then Zeke from yours as well and some of the challenges it's presenting to the press that are trying to cover the White House. This is like, we could spend two hours on this topic, yeah, which I know right. we're not. But I will say a couple observations. Um, one is it's often presented as a, uh, we are going around the media versus the media. That is actually not our intention. Um, you know, our intention is to reach the American public and to reach them with information about our policies and what we're doing. We also think it's vitally important to work through the media, answer questions, work through tough stories, deal with difficult questions, or, or pitch stories that are about topics or things we're doing. But I think part of it is a recognition that dates back before this administration, um, but is that everybody doesn't watch the evening news. Millions of people do, right? So that's still valuable. And I'm a believer that television is still a huge driver of information. Um, but we got to, you know, if we're looking at COVID and how we're trying to get out to communities and reach people who are, have, are more hesitant, but also just need information or don't know how to get access, we can't just do everything through daily newspapers because that's assuming everybody reads them and that's inaccurate. And our role as the government is to make sure we're disseminating information out to a broad swath of the public. I will say that the president's view on Twitter, obviously it's an understatement to say it differs from the last president, um, but is one, we don't think here Twitter is real life necessarily. It doesn't re re represent every person in the public. We know that through data, but we also know, or I should say this is more my view than his view, because I don't think he's dug deep into this rabbit hole at this moment, but like, that it is also a, a means of information traveling that's media information. The, the big audience of the Twitter for us is the media, right? You're actually speaking to the media through Twitter. You're not trying to go around them because a lot of reporters are on Twitter and information is debated and disseminated on Twitter. So when, you know, in the, in the way of like, and Zeke was talking about how the media news cycle has changed and how exhausting it is for them, which I get, and I'm on the other end of it, but it's also true that, you know, I have two little kids. I don't wake up in the morning and like spread out print newspapers on my dining room table and like analyze them. I wish I could. That's the dream. But I have two preschoolers, so it's not the reality. But I do look at what's on Twitter, what's popping, what are people speaking to? I do. You don't want to admit that, but that is still a driver of a lot of the conversations. And that's kind of a big change in development. It certainly impacts how um, we think about what the biggest stories of the day might be. See, um, just to pick up, I just, you know, two different but somewhat related points there. Is one is sort of you know, you know, yes, social media has you know, give, given any administration more tools to communicate, but by and large, where most you know, most people have a, an in, an informed opinion about you know they like Donald Trump or they dislike Donald Trump that they like you know Joe Biden they dislike Joe Biden. They probably got those set of facts somewhere through, you know, a media filter. You know, you know that they they, didn't, they probably weren't on Twitter. They probably got it, you know, from the news coverage of that social media message. Uh, and I think that's you oh, know, sure. whether be it. And so I think you know, it, you know, it is true that you know, you know, there are more, the White House has more, more, you know, more ways to engage with the public, but a, a lot of it ends up going still going through uh, the press. And I think the other. Part of this, and I wanted you know we talked we talked about this a little bit when we talk, we talked about the briefing as well. But you know the importance of seeing a, a of having a press corps there that uh, in in that format, you know, sort of holding an administration account that for forty five minutes, an hour a day, the the president's designated representative has to come to the briefing room, which is sort of it kind of is the press's footprint, the real estate within the White House the complex on, on on government property there, um, and you know and take questions and you know. Not friendly ones, and uh, always, and uh, uh, you know, it's it's you know, it, we can we can be adversarial without being adversaries. And you don't there doesn't need to be raising of voices, but you know, that is a, a potent symbol of you know the help and strength of our democracy, you know, for the rest of the world. Um, and you know, you know, it, it, it's not always about necessarily you know, does that generate a bit of information? Does you know, it, 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 is the answer going to you know, is that quote? From Jen going to be in a story that we write necessarily is that you know that's not the point. There is also this higher purpose um, to these engagements, 
I mean, it was, it's, you know, not just true of this administration, but true of, 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 of others previously. It's a, you know, it, it's a symbol around the world. And it's also uh, an opportunity uh, at times to sort of, you know, hold an administration's feet to the fire, you know, for, on, on behalf of their supporters and on behalf of the people who didn't vote for that president, depending on the day, depending on the person asking the question, depending on the, on the story. And uh, I think, you know, that, that's sort of the other piece of this. Yeah, that, that's such an important point. And and I totally agree with that. And that's why we do the briefings. And one of the reasons why we did, it sounds weird for me to say that's why we do the briefings, but it's one of the reasons you're sending a message to the world that we are going to project. We are going to take, we're going to have this help, this back and forth with the press corps. We're going to be pushed. We're going to be asked tough questions. We're going to, um, you know, provide information five days a week. And the state department is going to do it five days a week. And the department of defense is going to do it a couple of days a week. And I remember uh, one of, uh, Zeke's colleagues, Matt Lee, who is like a notorious State Department um, reporter, um, who is very tough historically, and I say this with a bit of respect, on the press, the spokespeople of the State Department. And when I was there, the Russians loved him because they felt like he was really hard on us. And so he was kind of a folk hero there. And he said to me, you know, the thing is, is that we have these back and forth several times a week. They don't do that. That is like a U.S. value, right? That is what we are projecting to the country and the world, which is what, so why it's one of the reasons it's so important to keep these briefings going around the government, no matter who's in office. So it sounds to me one of the debates over the past couple of years has been, you know, are these briefings really worth it? Is, are they outdated? It sounds to me like you'd say they aren't outdated, that they are worth it. I think especially in this moment, um, they are, it's vital that the United States send a message to the world that we are a country that um, is going to have this healthy back and forth with a free press and that we do that in the White House, that we do that in the State Department, that we do that in the Defense Department. Uh, and I also think, I didn't touch on this earlier, uh, it's important also, it pushes the internal processes uh, and the muscles in the White House to end in the State Department and in the Department of Defense to kind of finalize decisions and what we're going to say about things, because there's the pressure from it being coming up in the briefings. And that's hugely, hugely important um, because you get, you know, you get, you get decisions made, but you know, I, th there's always questions about what can be modernized. You know I mean? we uh, Sean Spicer did this a little bit and we've started to do versions of bringing in regional reporters, you know, even when COVID um, is over or when we're through, uh, you know, when we have, move to a new stage of the pandemic and we have a full briefing room, people who don't live in Washington aren't in the White House, covering the White House, right? That is missing a perspective. So there is a need to continue to think how, about how to modernize it or add on to it or do addendums to it. That's incumbent upon every person who's going to have this job in the future. Uh, but I still think, I mean, utility is, it's, it sends a vital message to the world. Um, and also it's hugely, hugely effective internally on getting answers. I have so many places I want. I would want to jump off from there, but I want to get to at least one or two different issues before we go to students. So maybe I'll I'll come back to this. Um, Jen, you talked about your time at the State Department for a little bit. You know, there's a there's a huge you know group of students at Georgetown who care about foreign policy and national security, and I'd love to hear from each of you. Um, there has been every administration has bumped into the tension between national security and the public's right to know. Um, and a lot of times there's behind the scenes discussions between you know, your predecessors and national editors about a story someone may be working on, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm wondering, and I'd love to start with you, Jen, sort of how, are you, how do you navigate that when there's a potential national security issue? How do you weigh that against the public's right to know? And how do you deal with the press on that? I mean, it's really important to hold for any administration to hold their self, themselves to a very high standard, and that, uh, in that, uh, in that sense, you know, you referenced, which is absolutely true historically, right? There are moments when um, very good reporters, uh, you know, reported on uh, potential assets overseas or operations, right, happening overseas, national security operations. And there are times historically where you get the CIA director on the phone with an editor and explain people's lives are at risk or somebody's lives are at risk. And that is a discussion and a debate Zeke can speak to more than I can about what that looks like in the media side. But it's also important for, from our end, you know, you're always irritated when there are leaks, right? Because it's 
not on your own timeline. Oh, no, you, you know this super well, too, whether it's personnel or a component of a policy plan. But there's a difference between a component of the American Families Plan being out early and us being irritated about that and, and a, a national security operation overseas uh, being exposed, right? And it really is not a bit of a boy who cried wolf scenario, right? It is not the fault of the reporter who gets information that they got information and it's ahead of our timeline. That is typically not their fault. Uh, somebody gave them that information. It was in the know. But there are times when you have to use that chip because it is or have that discussion and you want the credibility to be able to have it and know that you are not the girl crying wolf. Zeke, what about on your end? When a, when a White House comes to you and says this, you guys have a story and it's going to put American lives at risk. How do you how do you discuss that with your team? You know, a lot of that those conversations happen it, candidly, you know, well above my pay grade uh, at the level of Julie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, at, at the level of Julie Pace, who you all heard from before. Um, but uh, no, I, I think some of the ways we think it through it is, you know, nobody's trying to, you know, it, it's it's a balancing act between you know the public's right to know this information is, you know, if, if, if this conversation is happening, it's information that the public, you know, that we would certainly interest the public and probably is important enough that they know about. Um, and then on the other side, what are the potential, uh, you know, what are the potential harms of that information co coming out? I think uh, just w one one bit there, I, I just want to touch on that Jen mentioned is sort of, you know, it's not the, the you know, the, the fault of the reporter for getting that information. It's also important, important to recognize, you know, sort of, you know, the role that governments historically have, the U.S. government in, at times has had in investigating or cracking down on, on journalists, you know, who have published, you know, significant leaks of classified information. You know, it's the role of journalists to try to get this information out there uh, it's, it's to sort of you know develop sources within the government within other governments uh, to keep the public informed and, and then you know once they have that information to use that information in, in a way that's you know it, it responsible uh, and that means weighing all the all, all the attendant consequences but you know obviously you know you know we're first amendment organization it's not the role of the government to crack down on journalists for doing their jobs um we're going to go to student questions in a moment and again i have such a long list but i want to ask one more before we do um, and I will go to Zeke first on this one. Uh, another uh, debate over the past couple of years in the way the press covered the White House um, is the reliance on anonymous sourcing and background conversations. I'm curious your thoughts on when that is actually appropriate. And I know the AP uh, has sort of a different standard than a lot of your colleagues, but thinking about your colleagues in the briefing room, when is that appropriate? Is that appropriate? Um, should everyone do what the AP does and insist that, you know, if you want to tell me something, you got to put your name on it. It's a challenge that every reporter deals with, you know, day in and day out, particularly on the White House beat, where, you know, at times the White House will say something because it's not in their interest to have somebody other than the principal, you know, with the, with the quote next to their name. And, and we get it. That's, that's their job. Our job is to, you know, Get, try to get an on the record quote in that story to inform uh, to inform the public, um, and so you know at, at the AP we we we, uh, we you know pretty much never run a, a, a quote without you know on, on background um, you know we, we strive for the on, on the record quotes that's sort of the standard we set but that's you know that that other uh, every news organization will, will has their own you know practices and that's also good separately, you know, as a, for the Correspondents Association, we don't police the editorial content or the editorial policies of, of our members. And I think that's, it's important because, you know, it is, it's sort of, it's a marketplace of, of ideas and, a, and, and just competition between these outlets. And that's, that's healthy for democracy writ large. Um, I, I will say, you know, one of the lessons of the, of the last in, uh, administration and particularly in the, some of those very early days was how, you know, that, that, that the cloak of anonymity could be used to sort of, uh, you know, in in ways that were, you know, to, to misdirect or to carry out personal or, or, or uh, internal uh, policy uh, agendas or personal uh, agendas. And we saw some of that play out probably in the first, you know, five or six months of the, of the Trump administration um, in ways that probably did a disservice to readers. Uh, and I think, I think that, you know, over the course of the last administration, you saw, uh, you know, a far more judicious use of them, some of that from, 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 from reporters and certainly a lot more care in terms of, you know, I'm thinking back to the very early days of the Trump administration when there were sort of the, the, two, the three warring factions within, the, within that, that's been very well documented. And, you know, you get one or the other would, would leak about the third 
Um, and you sort of had to check everyone's motives involved because it was not necessarily that they were giving you something that was true, truthful. It was, they were trying to, there's an ulterior motive there. And I think that's sort of the one extreme. The other is, you know, you know on background, the president's going to go visit, you know, such and such place tomorrow. Um, you know, it's factual information. It's publicly verifiable. Does it really need to be on, uh, on background? No. But, you know, this way around saying the White House said it happened. So I think mean, it's, it's a spectrum. It's something we, we as journalists, you know, struggle with. You know, daily, we want the information for our readers, but we also, you know, sometimes we can't always get it under the attribution terms we'd like. Yeah. Jen, I, what about from your perspective? Yeah. Well, sometimes I will say, just to make this like a little less like cloak and daggery, um, <laughs> that a lot of times what happens is that we try, we want the person who's the expert on semiconductor chip production to talk to the AP, right? And sometimes we have to go to that person and say, hey, you can do it on background and they'll say, okay, I just wouldn't be comfortable otherwise because I've literally never spoken to a reporter before. That's not every time, but that happens more often than you think. And one of the things we're really focused on supporting the president is to get more policy people engaged in ex communicating, explaining things to the press and the press, Zeke aside, I mean, you know, look, are intimidating. If, if it's not what you do on a daily basis and people don't want to mess up and they don't want to say anything that hurts the president or makes them look bad. So not every time, but sometimes that's it. But I, I also would say that to Zeke's point, different media organizations have different uh, approaches and this works both ways. So we also, there are also media organizations out there who will remain nameless, but who come, will come to us and say, we have three sources on background saying there's a disarray among the senior staff on X issue or that there's disagreement and it's background sources, not on the record sources or sources close to the Biden administration are telling us. Right. And then we have to respond to that, these background sources. So that also happens, which believe me, we'd love to put an end to that as well. OK, let's start getting to the good questions now and bring students into the conversation. Uh, when I call your name, uh, you will be on screen. Um, tell us who you are, your affiliation, and then ask your question. So let's start with Julia. Hi, um, my name is Julia Bimbrook, and I am a master's student at Northwestern University and one of the scholarship recipients. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. Uh, Jen, my question is for you, and you touched on it a little bit throughout, but I'm curious what a regular day looks like for you, if that's even a thing in this role, and then also how you prepare before going into a briefing when you have to cover so many different topics. Sure. Well, first, congratulations on being a scholarship uh, awardee. That's awesome. Congratulations. Oh, can you hear me? Uh -oh. Yes. Thank you so much. Great. Um, sorry, I'm having technical issues too. Zeke needs to write a story about we need more funding for technology in here. That's a separate thing. Um, I will say um, a typical day for me, I have two little kids, two preschoolers. So I wake up around in the fives, I like to say. Um, and oftentimes what my kids have discovered, I didn't predict this necessarily, is that that's the time where we're going to have a lot of quality time together. So most days start with me this morning, I read Pinocchio with my daughter. I also returned a call um, from somebody from our COVID team. Uh, you know, we walked the dog. I took a shower. She tried on some dresses. You know, that's that's often how, in my closet, that's how, often how things kick off. But what people don't often see is that, you know, I have this amazing team of people who work with me, you know, who are part of the press team. It's smaller than people think. It's only about 10 people. But this group of people, you know, are incredible. I mean, they have these big beats of issues like COVID or climate or immigration, and they are deeply embedded with the policy experts, getting answers to the questions that Zeke or ABC or Fox or whomever is going to ask on a daily basis, not because we know the questions, but because we have a sense of what's in the news that day. So they're, they're kind of the heart and soul of the press team. And we spend about an hour um, prepping questions, going through the policy questions, uh, figuring out what's in the news, um, what people care about. Maybe it's a follow-up from the day before. Uh, sometimes I call up, this is one of the best things about working here, you call up Jake Sullivan or Susan Rice or Jeff Science and get direct information from them. So it's always a little a little frenetic, um, but that's you know typically what the morning looks like. Okay, Julia, thanks so much for the question. All right, next up, let's bring in Alex. 
Alex, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Alexander Bowman and I am a junior in the class of 2022, uh, double majoring in English and art. And I'm not representing them here, but I'm also the political cartoonist for the Lincoln Project. Uh, I have two questions and Zach uh, graciously told me I'm allowed to ask both. Um, first, how do you think we should address the increasing divide among Americans and where they get their news? And second, a uh, question a little bit more personal to me, um, how do you think a young person who's hoping to be civically active, empathetic, ideally funny and like productive and helping bridge the divide on social media, especially Twitter, uh, should go about civic discourse and satire? Nick, you want to kick that one off? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can kick that, 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 that first one. Um, I, I think, you know, read more news and read, more, read different news. And that, that's my advice to everyone in, in, in every different context is, you know, you're, Turn on the, if you are someone who has a particular political persuasion, watch, you know, a cable television network that has the opposite one just to see what they're talking about. Read, you know, not just your hometown newspaper, but national newspapers, international newspapers, local newspapers in different parts of the country that may be you know, dissimilar to your own. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the more you know, we all do that here in the Beltway, the better we will understand the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Uh, and that will a show up in our in our in our news coverage and, and, and explain and, you know being able to explain issues to, uh, for them, uh, but then also hopefully that will that will rub off uh, on them too. They'll they'll they'll, they'll read some of them as well. You know maybe I'm a bit of an idealist there, but that that's that's my hope. Uh, when it comes to fixing social media, that is uh, that's a tough one, um, and I, I I'm gonna turn it over to Jen for that one if she has any grand ideas. Uh, well, I agree with Zeke completely on that. I mean, one on like reading all different kinds of news and not just reading things you agree with, uh, read all different perspectives, read long form, short form, etc. cetera. Um, you know, I would say that one of the things, and I, and maybe I'm an idealist too, um, and a bit of an optimist, like maybe Zeke and I are similar in that way, but we don't need to underestimate the intelligence of the American people, right? Or your friends or colleagues. I mean, first of all, I go to Georgetown, so everybody you live and work with is really smart, off the chart smart, but, um, and as you think about how you're going to be a part of participating in civic discourse, don't dumb it down, you know, I mean, what are you interested in? What are you passionate about? Um, become educated on that issue, and maybe your role is to play a role in educating your friends and peers. That's the most valuable voice, by the way, is people's friends and peers. That's why actually some of these social media things are so effective, but you can be a force for good. Um, by contributing to the dialogue. You don't have to debate people, but you can provide context. You can provide more information. Um, you read something about climate, the climate crisis in a book. Here's a statistic that's not out there. Here's what my friend experienced. And you know, I think sometimes that's undervalued. Um, and I'm a believer that policy is cool and fun and hip, and maybe we're all near thirds here, uh, but, but don't, don't underestimate. You don't have to change your interests in that stuff or become like, a pithy weather girl just to be on social media just like be you and be intelligent about the things you want to talk about i wrote all that down thank you <laughs> awesome thanks alex all right let's go to charlie hi uh thank you so much for to both of you for doing this um my name is charlie i'm a freshman in georgetown school of foreign service so uh, I'm very interested in foreign policy and uh, particularly the president's goal of restoring America's image abroad and um, rebuilding some of our relationships with our allies. Uh, so I'm interested to hear what either or both of you think is the role of the press secretary um, as kind of the face of the White House and America's press in general in achieving or affecting this goal, um, especially as other countries may be wary of um, U.S. policy stances changing with each new administration or are at times polarized media, like taking different stances on these issues? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start it. And, and Zeke has covered a lot of foreign trips and, and foreign policy, too. So I'm sure we'll have lots of insightful thoughts here. You know, I would say, look, even just doing the daily briefing and having that healthy exchange back and forth is sending a message that that's part of our value that that back and forth is part of democracy and something we value here. It's not gonna change overnight, right? We've been here 107 days or something like that. Um, and we know that. So, uh, and I, you know, my role that I can play is um, doing the briefing and projecting that one of our values is the freedom of press and that healthy exchange. 
and also to providing some context about what the historic nature of these relationships are. You know, there is a desire often, um, I'm not saying it's by the media, I just say in general for it to be kind of a black and white issue. Like take our relationship with Russia, right? Our relationship with Russia is not zero sum. We don't see it that way, right? That is more nuanced to explain. We're gonna work with them on areas where we agree, new start, non-proliferation, and we're gonna voice our views when we don't. And we want a stable relationship. Diplomacy is much more, and national security is much more complex and multi-layered, right? It's not a it's not a, a game of politics. There's politics in countries, but so I, I would say those are two of the roles I can play, right? Is projecting that um, freedom of press is a value, pushing for press access when we go on trips, pushing for media access and press conferences when we go on trips, which Z can tell you is sometimes an issue depending on the country you're in, but also um, resetting what it, what it looks like to have a national security process, how decision-making is made and giving more context on the relationships and how the president sees them. Um, I'll just touch on that briefly since we, you know, we're about a month out from the, uh, from President Biden's first foreign trip. This is, you know, uh, there is no foreign leader that travels the world quite like the American president does. Whichever American president uh, it is, you know, there are 13 members of the press uh, on Air Force One. Um, there's, you know, there, there are going to be, you know, dozens of press following uh, on a charter plane, usually particularly on, on, a, on a bigger trip. Uh, you know, press secretaries of, of you know, uh, of, of both parties working for different presidents have, you know, physically put themselves, you know, between a foreign press minder who's trying to keep the press out and the American press trying to get in to cover that moment because they recognize the power um, that that sends uh, to, to the, the rest of the world. And I think, you know, that's one of those where, you know, you know, what we're coming at, where our, our, our objectives are, are maybe slightly different um, than the White House in that moment. We're not there trying to sort of spread uh, you know, American values abroad. We're trying to gather information about the president, but the very presence of the American press doing their jobs independently of the government does send a, a, a symbol around the world and be, you know, and it holds, and it really, you know, for other countries that, other world leaders that don't uh, engage in, in questions from uh, from an adversarial uh, press. I mean, it, it 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 stands in stark relief, and I think that's you know one of, one of the things that we that's in our control that we can do is keep doing our jobs in, in that format. Charlie, thanks for the question. So we are just about out of time. So I want to close with one last question to each of you. Um, I guarantee you, there are some people in this Zoom room who are hoping to one day be the White House press secretary or to be a White House correspondent uh, uh, covering a uh, presidency. So I'm gonna do the obligatory, you know, give them advice question, but with a twist. You know, Zeke, I'd like you to give advice to the future press secretary. And Jen, I'd like you to give advice to the future White House correspondent. That's, that's fun though, I like that. Um, I, I will say, uh, you know, the most important thing for anybody um, in, in, you know, in my mind, who works in a press secretary role in, in Washington, the press role in Washington, is the ability to sort of compartmentalize, you know, the ability to deal with reporters on a story they they dislike, you know, uh, you know, they'd be really angry at a reporter at one moment and then be able to work with them constructively the next uh, and sort of separate, you know, the, the, their personal feelings at the moment and their and their ability to do their jobs professionally. I think that's that's one. The other would be, you know, your 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 word is your bond, uh, and, and particularly when you're when you're role that you want to have is to sort of be the the spokesperson for any person in position of power. Uh, you know, your credibility is everything. And if you don't have it, uh, you know, that's going to follow you around. And so starting that foundation off early um, is important. That doesn't mean you have to be right 100% of the time. It means when you're wrong, um, you know, do what journalists try to do. And that is, you know, to, you know, you know be as, as, as loud about when we're wrong as when we are when we know we're right. And, you know, that, that's, and that way your credibility leads the way. Jen, how is his advice? Advice. Um, that's good, good. advice. I'll okay. take it down. Um, so, okay, for a future White House AP or White House correspondent. Correspondent, yeah. I would say the biggest thing I would say is, um, you know, there's always going to be breaking news every day, which we all understand people are going to have to cover. But if you develop a focus and interest and almost an expertise in certain issue areas, that makes you even more appealing to the White House to give scoops to, to connect with high level officials, to um, you know, ensure that you become the person who's getting access to information on that particular issue. 
because you're coming to the table as like an informed um, engager on it. Um, and, you know, we, we obviously, you know, we do lots of briefings on everything. We give a wide range of access. Reporters do their own reporting and get tons of their own information. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but uh, it always is in our minds like, oh, so-and-so expression in interest in Russia. So-and-so is really interested in COVID. They've been doing some interesting reporting on COVID. It doesn't mean it's flattering of us. It just means that they are deep on an issue. And there's like a real respect for that policy expertise and know-how uh, in the press corps. And, um, you know, I don't think that always gets talked about uh, a ton. But I, my second thing is, um, you know, to echo kind of what, what Zeke said, in that um, there are going to be moments where you have a disagreement in the briefing room or otherwise, right? And it can be adversarial. Reporters can be mad at us because they didn't get information they thought they had access to because we gave them the wrong information, not through malintent. Sometimes it happens even when you have the best intentions and you have to be able to move forward. And while you have different objectives, the best relationships are where there's a level of trust where you know you're not trying to screw the other person over on a daily basis. You're just trying to do your jobs. It doesn't always mean you're aligned. Many days you have different objectives, but you know developing that sort of level of, of trust and, you know, personal relationship is also, I would say, important in um, doing the job effectively. Okay. Zeke, thumbs up on that advice? Uh, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, thank you both so much. My only regret uh, is that we weren't able to do this in person. So we're just going to have to do it again once things uh, open up. Um, but Zeke, Jen, thank you so much for taking so much of your busy schedules uh, to have this conversation with us. Zeke, I want to thank you and the entire White House Correspondents Association uh, for partnering with us on this day um, and what we're hoping will be a regular conversation uh, about the role of the press and the presidency. Jen, it's always nice to have you back at GU Politics. We miss you as a fellow, so we're just going to have to find other ways to bring you back as we did today. It's great to be with you. And to the audience, thank you for spending so much of your day with us. Um, this concludes geopolitics programming for the semester, um, but stay tuned because we're, we're cooking up some fun stuff over the summer and particularly excited to see you all back on campus uh, this fall. So with that, thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>